A federal judge upholds San Jose's gun owner insurance mandate. Plus, Ohio State University's Sophie Jadvik on her study showing a gun safety video can prevent accidental shootings among children. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. No, the devil's got no hold on me. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gutowski. I'm also the founder of TheReload.com, where you can Head over and sign up for our free weekly newsletter if you want to keep up to date with what's going on with guns in America. This week, we are discussing gun safety and a new study that finds um, a gun safety video may help reduce children's impulse to handle a a gun that they find. A pretty interesting study and interesting results. And uh, to talk about it, we have actually the lead author from The Ohio State University, Dr. Sophie Javik, who is joining us right now. I'm sorry if I've butchered your name a little bit there. Can you um, say it for our audience and just give you a little bit of an introduction to those who don't know who you are? Yeah. So my name is Dr. Chadvik. It's a Norwegian name. Um, I came to the, uh, to the Ohio State University to study communication, and I am about to complete my PhD in uh, communication. Uh, and i have My work primarily focuses on aggression and individual differences in aggression and ways of reducing aggression. And so this research goes under the domain of reducing aggression or preventing Mm. preventing violence. Interesting. Yes. Uh, And so can you just give us uh, just some of the the baseline results of what you guys found from the study? Yeah, so in the study, we found that if kids watched a one-minute gun safety video compared to a one-minute car safety video that was recorded with the Ohio State Chief of Police, they were more likely to come out and tell us about the guns. They were less likely to pick up the guns. They were less likely to shoot the gun if they picked it up, and they they held it for a shorter amount of time, and they pulled it in general, fewer times. Uh, yes. Well, that sounds like really positive results. I mean, that's that's a really good outcome, at least uh, for this specific study that you you guys have uh, undertaken here. Can you, can you just give us a little bit of background on how exactly the process worked? Like, how did you find these results? Like, what did you? How was this? What was the setup for this? So the setup for the study was that parents contacted us if they were interested in the study. We obviously had advertising out on Facebook and other social media platforms. And then parents contacted us and asked us to be a part of the study. They had to have two kids. So either these kids had to be siblings, they could be friends, but it had to be two children in the same age range. So from eight to 12 years old, they did not have to be the exact same age, but in that age range. And uh, we sent parents different documents, uh, asking them uh, about their demographics, uh, asking them about their kids' interest in guns. And we also sent kids uh, a gun safety video. So by random assignment, basically by the flip of a coin, kids were randomly assigned. These pairs of kids were randomly assigned to watch either a gun safety video uh, with the Ohio State Chief of Police or a car safety video. And these videos were about one minute long. So in the gun safety video, the uh, police officer informed the kids that guns are not toys. They are not to be played with. If they ever find a real gun, they should never pick it up or move it. Instead, they should find an adult and tell them about the location of the gun. Uh, They should not bring guns to schools. And if they see or hear anything about guns, they should report it to the school or the police officer at hand. Um, Okay, so they got that's basic uh, gun safety training for for children. You see that uh, as the common advice that that most people train firearms. I'm a firearms uh, instructor myself, and that is what you would tell a child. So you showed them that video uh, to to half of them. Yes. And then and then the other half got. Uh, another video that was about car safety instead. Yes. So the other kids were sent a video where the same police officer in the same uniform was talking about motor vehicle safety. So basically car safety. So 
more in the domain of always wear a seatbelt. You should always buckle up before the car starts moving. Kids under the age of 13 should sit on a back seat and mm -hmm. that kids should have a booster seat if they're not over a certain height and so forth. Okay. Um, and, so, and so there are very similar videos that they watched, but one was about gun safety and one was about car safety. And then you brought them, it was a week later, to your into a laboratory where you guys were observing them, right? Yes. So about a week later, after watching this video on their device of choice at home alone, they were asked to come into the lab. And when they arrived in the lab, they were first asked to watch a 20 minutes movie clip. Uh, this was either a movie call or a clip from a movie called The Rocketeer or a clip from the movie called The National Treasure. Both great movies, by the way. Yes, so both action movies uh, yes. with, with with violence and uh, mm -hmm. but still appropriate for the age range of these kids. And yeah, after PG. watching uh, 20 minutes of this movie, they were asked what they thought about the movie. And so they rated on a questionnaire and an iPad what they thought about the movie. And after doing that, they were placed in a different room where we have different toys and games, such as Jenga, Uno, Checkers. Uh, but they, we also had Nerf guns and foam swords and two 9mm handguns. And all of this was placed in the file cabinet in the room. So in the top drawer, you had the, toy, or the games. In the middle drawer, you had the toys. And in the bottom drawer, you had the two 9mm handguns. And so these handguns are obviously modified, so they could never be used as firearms. Uh, but basically what we've done to those is that we've replaced the magazine with a counter that counts the number of times the trigger is pulled with sufficient force to discharge the gun. Mm, okay. And so during the time that the kids were in the room, we were watching the kids on a hidden camera in the room. Uh, and we were, and these were just uh, real quick on the gu the gun aspect. These were fire. These are real firearms that you guys had disabled, so they can't physically fire any ammunition. And there obviously wasn't any ammunition present, right? And uh, but they were, so they had the actual feel and weight of a real firearm. They weren't like a a BB gun or an uh, airsoft gun or anything like that. These it was, it was very obvious that these were real firearms when you handled them. Yes, they have the weight of a real firearm because they are real firearms. The only thing that we've taken out is the part with the magazine, but we have replaced it with a lot of wires inside the gun. So it still has mm -hmm. the same weight. Um, mm -hmm. And before each session with these kids in our lab, we conducted thorough investigations that these were in fact the same guns and that there was no other objects in the room that we were using than the objects that were supposed to be there. So the screen that they okay. were watching the movie on or the toys, uh, which was really important to us for the safety part. Um, yes. Yes, certainly. And so, uh, so they're, they're in there, they're, they don't understand obviously that this is part of the study, I assume. No, most and, kids did not understand. <laughs> okay. And so they're in there, they think they're playing, you know, there's just some time, you know, they, maybe they think they're there to watch the movies and rate them and then, they're, they go into this room to, you know, wait, wait for whatever. And there's some toys to play with. And then the toys are in the same area, the same filing cabinet as the firearms. So they're, uh, you know, they, it's more likely that they'll come across them, I guess. And, uh, and so from that point, what happens? Yeah. So first of all, the kids are taught, told when they got into the lab that they are here so that we can see what kids do for entertainment. Uh, and so that's why they're watching a movie. That's why they're uh, okay. playing with toys. And so from the point of when they are placed in the room with the toys and the guns, um, we are sitting with the parents in our surveillance room for 20 minutes watching what the kids do if they find the gun. And so we found we saw that most kids open the drawer with the guns. Uh, we also saw that kids either they reacted uh, by staring at each other and some luckily came running out to tell us about the gun uh, or the guns and then we had i was sitting in the main room and my research assistant and the parents were sitting in the lab room so so that they would have someone approaching them if if they came out 
And so when they came out, they would tell me and I would ask them, uh, I would tell them that I would take them away and that, that, that they could continue to play. If they did not come out and tell us, which most kids did not, uh, we, would, uh, we would see what they did during the playtime. And so some kids decided to pick up the guns uh, and when they held it, they noticed that it was heavy and was surprised by this because it felt like a real gun and they put it back down. Other kids um, held it for a longer time and were more curious about the gun. Uh, some kids decided to pull the trigger on the gun um, and some kids decided to pull the trigger quite a few times. Others decided to only do it once and were kind of scared and put it that back down. Um, but we also had kids that pull, pulled them up and started shooting at each other and playing with them uh, like it was a toy. Right, right, which is the, the concerning behavior. That's the thing that we don't want to see, right, from kids who find a gun uh, because that's how accidental shootings happen and how kids can uh, be killed. It's something that is a real problem that does uh, obviously occur every year in this country at, at a rate that nobody is uh, satisfied with and, and everyone wants to see reduced. And so the interesting thing that you found, though, uh, with this, as we talked about at the very beginning, is that there was a noticeable statistical difference between the kids who watched the gun safety video and the kids who didn't, right? Yes, there was a significant difference between the kids that watched the gun safety video. They were more likely uh to come out and tell us they were less likely to, to pick up the gun they were less likely to pull the trigger uh and they were less likely uh, or they held it for a shorter amount of time and so just showing them this one minute gun safety video had a huge impact on the behavior obviously we didn't find what you would hope for that a hundred percent of the times they didn't pick up the gun uh right. but there was a huge difference Right. And, uh, and, and yeah, I know, I, I think that first point is important to note. What was the percentage of kids who still ha handled the firearm, uh, even if they'd watched the video? Um, I can't remember specifically the statistics. What is, but it was still a fairly significant amount, right? Yes, it was a significant amount. I think it was more than half, if I'm remembering correctly yes. from, from reading the study. Um, so, I know, you know that more than, or more than half uh, picked up the gun, but I just couldn't remember the difference in the yeah. specific study. That's okay. Um, you know, and we'll, we have a story on our site uh, about this, the study, so people can go and 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 read those those stats for themselves uh, as well. And you guys have written uh, about it uh, too. Uh, for what was the there was an outlet that you wrote a piece for the conversation, I believe it's called. Um, yes. That uh, where you have a little more detail. On, on the study, because obviously the study is in an academic journal. And so, um, uh, you know, you have to subscribe to the journal to get the full thing. But but uh, regardless, there's a lot more information about, about it out there that people can look at the specific percentages of how this went. But the point is that, you know, it's not a perfect solution, right? Uh, but it was something that that is promising, that uh, perhaps can be built upon. Um, and you guys had a couple of conclusions or a couple of notes, ideas about why the video was was successful, why it was useful. Can you give us some insight into that? Yes. So I quickly just pulled up to answer your first question. So about 39% of the kids in the gun safety video condition uh, picked up the gun, whereas okay. about 67% of the kids in the car safety condition picked up the gun. So actually, uh, you know, a majority of kids who watched the gun safety video did not pick up the gun then. Yes. So that is pretty significant. Whereas two thirds who didn't watch it did handle the gun. So yeah. that is, yeah, I mean, that's pretty big. Uh, not perfect, like you said, but pretty substantial. Um, uh, so what, what were some of the reasons that you guys had for why uh, you thought the video was successful in, in getting these kids to to not handle the firearm, not pull the trigger, or, or at least reduce the, the number who did? So one of the primary reasons is we had a one minute video and we know that children have a short attention span. And so having a very short video 
was intentional so that they would actually pay attention to the whole video that we were recording. Um, another reason is that we had a police officer in full uniform and we know that children in this age range view um, police officer in full uniform as more authoritarian than others and they are more likely therefore to listen to what they are saying. And so by choosing a short video with a person that the children would see as an authority figure, uh, we were hoping that they would pay more attention. Okay. Which so you think that having the, the Ohio State Police Chief as the person to deliver the message in uniform uh, gave the kids a sense of uh, that they were authoritative in what they were saying and that they should pay attention and and listen to the what the officer had to say? Yes. It made the message come across as more important than if it was presented to them by maybe their parents. Uh, okay. But we did not compare parents to police officers. So we only know based on this video and prior research would need to focus on different people delivering the message. Right, right. Yeah, because um, because obviously you, you just did the one video and I'm sure you'd want to see more research in this area to see maybe test out different strategies for videos. Um, Cause I know the, uh, you guys in the paper mentioned, uh, I mean, cause, cause I think one of the obvious things that comes up uh, from this study, one of the, the sort of obvious points is that there is a national program that ha that has a gun safety video for children. It's from the National Rifle Association, right? It's called Eddie Eagle. And, um, and obviously the NRA reacted to your study by uh, promoting their, at Eagle program saying that, you know, it's a similar situation. And, um, and so it's evidence that their approach is, uh, potentially helpful. Right. And I think they, they claim to have reached something like 30 million children with their program. And I, as far as I'm aware, it's the only national program of its, of its type that is, uh, you know, something in the vein of what you guys did in this case. Uh, however, you know, you guys, you did talk about the Ed Eagle program briefly in your study, and you did have a critique based on this. Uh, so Ed Eagle is a cartoon character, and so it's a little eagle, obviously. Um, and you think perhaps it could be more effective using your method of having someone in uniform deliver the message? Is that, am I getting that right? Yes. So prior research, not our research from our lab, has shown that the effects of the Ed Eagle video is not sufficient. It doesn't really work. And so based on that and finding that our video really works, uh, we recommend probably changing uh, the video from having a cartoon uh, to having a police officer in uniform. Okay. So that's perhaps something that um, the NRA or other groups who are looking to replicate this sort of effect that you guys found should consider doing basically. Yes. I mean, they could consider changing uh, their videos. I know that this is also more of a schooling video that is a longer video uh, where kids watch several videos oftentimes about with Eddie Eagle. Uh, and so the, the differences between the videos indicates that our video works better. Um, okay. Although you obviously didn't, you didn't study didn't that directly because you didn't, you didn't show the kids the Eddie Eagle videos. No, but we're that's only what basing it on prior yeah. research showing that Eddie Eagle videos don't work. Okay. Okay. So you're, that's based on other research that, that you weren't involved in, but, yeah. and, and this study, just to be totally clear, did not compare Eddie Eagle to the Ohio State University video or uh, police chief video. It just, um, you're just basing that off of what you think worked in your video, basically. Yes. We're only okay. talking about why we think our videos worked uh, compared to why other research has said that other forms of delivering a safety message doesn't work. Okay. Um, Cause I also, there's also, uh, I guess the factor of uh, the age groups involved because Eddie Eagle to me, you know, I don't, I'm not sure exactly. I, I mean, I guess they're trying to hit, a, a wide swath of uh, children, perhaps starting younger than eight years old. And maybe that's why they went with the cartoon uh, character instead of a police officer. But, um, you know, your, your 
study focuses specifically on that eight to 12 year old, which is a little more mature uh, age group, obviously. And um, so I, w I wonder if there's perhaps an effect there as well. Um, but, uh, you know, that stuff, I guess, will be, need to be ferreted out in future research uh, because because they're studying directly address all of those questions, obviously. Yeah, we will need to test other age range as to see if the effect is persistent across age groups. Um, yeah. Right. And, and yeah, and, and test different methods perhaps as well to see what works best. Um, yeah, but I, I, you know, I guess it is certain, certainly evidence that this type of approach can be effective. Um, you know, whether or not the previous study, I don't know, you know, we'd have to look and examine that study and see what the, the deficiencies and strengths of it were. But the general approach seems viable based on what you guys found. Yes. I mean, okay. the prior study had compared more educational, so more schooling educational uh, purposes with Eddie Eagle. They didn't compare safety videos. Um, and so the, the effects might be there depending on what sample you choose, what, where in the country you're testing this. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot speak to the effectiveness of Ed Eagle. I can only say that prior research right. has shown that it isn't as effective and our research shows that our method is effective. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. Um, now, you, you found there were a couple other uh, factors that may have played a role as well in children deciding not to handle the guns that they found. What were some of those? Yeah, so some of the risk factors in the study were being male. So we found that boys tended to uh, behave more recklessly around the guns than uh, other genders. We also found that watching more age inappropriate movies on a general basis uh, was a risk factor. So we had kids rate the three movies they watched the most often, and we scored these uh, as to whether they were PG 13 or R rated as age inappropriate because that is above the age range of 8 to 12 year olds. And so okay. if children watched more age-inappropriate movie, uh, movies, they were also more likely to behave more recklessly around the guns. Because perhaps they're watching movies that show people using firearms irresponsibly or, or what have you. Yeah, so we know that in these movies there is more violence, there are more guns than in younger age range movies. And so that uh, is one of the predictions that we also made. Okay. Um, and we also found that when parents reported that their children were more interested in guns, that was also a risk factor for more reckless behavior around guns. Mm -hmm. But also interestingly, you found that parents who own firearms, that their children were more likely to, to not touch the guns, right? Yes, we did find that. Um, Prior research has reported that when parents own guns, they're more likely to talk to their kids about gun safety. Mm -hmm. And so assuming that gun owners do actually talk to their kids, uh, this relates to the fact that parents with guns uh, or children and children in households with guns are more likely to know more about gun safety. OK. And you saw that effect in this study as well. Yes, we did. And we did. same for if they'd had prior firearms safety training of some sort. Yes. So if ki uh, kids had previously taken a firearm safety course or watched a firearm safety video, they were also less likely to behave recklessly around the guns. And okay. a third and final of the protective factors was having negative attitudes towards guns. And so mm. if children said that they didn't think guns were cool or they didn't want people in their neighborhoods to have guns because they didn't like it. Uh, they were also less likely to behave recklessly. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. I mean, a lot of that sort of follows, right? If you, um, uh, hopefully if they've had firearm safety training, they're less likely to, to use a gun irresponsibly if they come across it. And, and hopefully if their parents own guns, they're teaching them, not to do that and and perhaps that's having an effect it sounds uh to some degree like maybe uh some of the focus should be on uh trying to help parents of uh, who don't have firearms of their own 
um, because, you know, the, the Associated Press found, I believe, is 46 percent of Americans report having a gun in their home. So even if you don't have a gun in your home, you, your children's friends, uh, their homes may have guns. And so it's uh, I mean, one of the takeaways to me, at least sounds like uh, for for parents who don't own firearms, that perhaps they should still consider getting their children some sort of gun safety training, whether it's this video or some other form of gun safety training. Yeah. So one of the things that we know is that only 40 percent of people that have guns actually have them secured. And so if you have a child that you haven't talked to about gun safety because you don't have guns or you're not wanting them to be exposed to it, so you're not talking about it, you're trying to prevent it, you're trying to avoid that uncomfortable conversation with your child, and they go over to a friend or someone from school, and you don't know, as a parent, what is in those uh, those parents' homes, and then your child might come across a firearm in that house and pick it up, and that is out of the parent's control. And so... If you had talked to your child about gun safety, that could prevent them from picking up the gun and maybe make it more likely that they come and tell you, as the police officer in our our video is encouraging. Uh, But if there's no education on gun safety, the child might pick it up because children are naturally very curious. Right. And you also talked about, uh, I guess, scripting. Um, in, in the study as well, this idea that what children see performed uh, is something that they might repeat, I guess, essentially sort of monkey see, monkey do sort of thing here. And um, so I guess that was part of the reason that you, maybe you showed them these movies that had uh, violent aspects to them. Um, and and then also might be one of the reasons why having the police officer demonstrate gun safety to them. Uh, or, or give them a script of what they should do if they find a gun helped, right? Yes. Yes. So we were in our study in a way testing whether the police officer would actually compete with the national treasure and these action movies that kids are often watching. And so we know that children are very often exposed to media, uh, that children are sitting on their iPads or in front of the TV a lot of the time. And we know that they're often then exposed to violent media because there has been an increase in violent media. Um, And we also know from research and from theories that children are likely to imitate the behavior of the role models that they have. And so movie characters become often become uh, role models for children. And so we're trying to counterbalance or counteract that with having a police officer that might serve as a different role model of safe behavior instead of unsafe behavior. Right. And you found that that it did in fact work. Yes, we did. And uh, just some more, uh, I guess, limitations of this study. Uh, So you, you obviously were working on a pretty short timetable here. They watched the video a week before they, went uh, to your lab and and uh, were presented with the firearms. That's a pretty short period of time. So you don't know exactly how long this effect might last. Yes. Yeah, so because participants in our study watched the safety video about a week before they came into our lab, we cannot say or establish long-term effects of watching a firearm safety video. And more longitudinal studies are needed to make those uh, conclusions. Hmm. Certainly. And um, the other uh, issue that I I just wanted to talk about briefly here, um, one, uh, you know, accidental shootings, which is what the study is addressing, right? That's the goal here is to try and prevent accidental shootings. You're not trying to prevent these children from, uh, you know, uh, self-harm or, um, assault or murder, right? That's not the goal of something like this. You're focused exclusively on trying to prevent accidental shootings by informing kids of how they should act when they see a firearm in real life. Yes, we are not with the study focused on talking about suicide. We're not talking about intentional murders. Um, Mm -hmm. We are focused on unintentional gun shootings among children in the United States. 
Right. And um, and accidental shootings have actually been on a pretty steep decline over the last several decades um, from what CDC data shows us. Uh, and so that's we are moving in a positive direction already. Um, but this but obviously, uh, as, as I think I stated at the top of the show, I think everyone across all political divides um, or ideological divides or whatever wants that number to get to zero if uh, you know possible even uh, you know but oh we always want to be continually reducing this and i guess that's presumably the goal here right with what you're what you guys are researching yeah so we are hoping that if children ever find a gun they will never pick it up and they will never try to shoot the gun um obviously all the reports on children actually finding a gun are not we don't know the true numbers there's never going to be uh, those are never going to be available to us. Uh, I know from this study that I had parents coming in saying that their child had in fact found a gun in their home. They had sh- shot a hole in the wall or they had been at a parent uh, at a friend's place and they had found a gun with their friend uh, and they came home and told their parents about it afterwards that, oh, you know what we found when we were at our friend's place. And so we're trying to avoid those scenarios. And by looking at Evertown's research, uh, I also have um, seen that we still have one child every day uh, being killed from unintentional shootings. Interesting. That's, uh, or I mean, maybe not killed, but shot. Yeah, Yeah, that that would make more sense with what I'm just from what I'm seeing with the CDC numbers. Uh, It appears there have been about 407. I guess exactly 407 deaths in this. Well, I, I should say too that I, uh, these numbers are for that age range of eight to 12. So this is not for all children. So the numbers will be larger for for all minors. Everyone uh, 17 and under um, will be uh, you know a higher number than this. But there are 407 um, unintentional shooting deaths from 1999 to 2020 among this age group that you studied. So it's, you know, it, it's still a significant problem. And I'm sure that you could probably multiply that by, uh, you know, a, a factor to get to total injuries as well. So, it, you know, I don't think anyone uh, would dispute that it's an issue. Um, I do think that there is some controversy over, uh, you know, the statistics that you guys started off with. The, this is sort of ancillary to the point of the, the what you're studying, um, and I guess that's why I bring it up as perhaps a bit of a critique, uh, because it's you start off with the, the claim or the statistics about gun deaths generally among one to 19 year olds. So obviously, you're including uh, some younger adults in there as well. Um, and, I, you know, I just wonder if that um, might mislead people a bit about the specific issue that you're addressing with this uh, this particular study, because you're focused here on accidental shootings, and those are not the leading cause of death among uh, children, uh, even if gun injuries are among the most common causes, because when you include murders and suicides. Yeah, so I think primarily the reason why we chose to include that information is that we wanted to compare it to um, motor vehicle incidents. And so by including information that deaths related to guns have surpassed basically uh, deaths related to cars uh, is is concerning and that we are also using car safety videos in our study which is why we are comparing these two and in that age range from 1 to 19 so those are children and teens uh, right. has surpassed um, the incident of motor vehicle and that's sure and so um no, one, so of the, one of the interesting things about this is that the reason why that's um, uh, with cars have decreased so much is that there has been enormous amount of resources put into decreasing these numbers uh cars have been made a lot more safer children are exposed to car safety videos uh everyone is exposed to knowing more about car safety but this has not happened for gun safety before the recent years. We have now that it's become this huge, this 
big of an issue, that's when we're starting to put money into doing research and to actually trying to make guns safer. Um, yeah. No, and, and I understand certainly that, uh, again, like I would agree and I think everyone would agree that it's a significant issue and a significant problem uh, that needs addressing. And there are a number of ways you can do that that are uh, not as controversial or uh, going to be um, as difficult to implement as, uh, you, you know, a, a lot of the other issues that we talk about most of the time on this show. Uh, you know, your solution is obviously something I think most people would not be opposed to or or find controversial or find objectionable. Uh, my, my only problem is with mixing statistics in this way. Um, I think it becomes misleading, because especially because even if you're talking about the 1 to 19 range, that's driven largely by um, by murder uh, among the older cohort of that that age group, and and then secondarily by suicide, which are serious issues that need addressing uh, as well, of course. But they are different from accidental shootings among younger children who don't understand the dangers of a gun, because obviously suicide and murder are not the issue of lack of information about how dangerous a firearm can be. That's they're basically the exact opposite problem, right? But um, it's just something that I, that was the main, that was my only critique that I had of the, uh, of the, the, the study and, and the write up of it. really more just the write up, the introduction of it. I understand you're trying to, um, you're trying to explain to people why you think this is a generally a, a, a significant issue. Uh, I just found that, uh, I would just prefer to, to, if it had been, uh, focused on the accidental shooting aspect of it, because that is still very important. And I do think that what you found, is a potential solution and maybe a potential improvement on some of the most popular methods for teaching children about gun safety, uh, especially through videos. So uh, that was the only reason that I brought this up. Uh, I did feel like it was worth addressing. So uh, I do appreciate you uh, responding to it. Um, but, but uh, you know, I think just to finish up here, what, what do you want to see um, done with the information that you guys have found on what's effective? So the primary thing that we would like done is that parents talk to their kids about gun safety and that education about gun safety is implemented, maybe not only in the home, but maybe also in more educational settings. Okay. Uh, and another For schools thing that- or Schools, yes, that would be a huge step forward uh, that children are actually talked to about not only what they should do if there is a mass shooting at their school, but what they should do if they ever find a gun. Uh, Another thing that we obviously want is that people that own guns uh, lock up their guns. Yeah, certainly. Um, You got keeping your firearms away from uh, any unauthorized user, especially a child is extremely important. Um, I, you know, I think that's a relatively uncontroversial thing. I do think that there is some, um, that some gun owners take issue with some of the ways that it's talked about with, uh, you know, storing your guns separate from the ammunition is makes a lot of sense when you're not actively using that firearm for home defense. But obviously a lot of people, that's the main reason they buy a firearm. Um, and so that that's one area, I guess. Uh, I guess the other thing that I would uh, um, just as a, a brief mention, why why do you, you see this a lot with researchers? Right. This uh, the the idea that safe storage necessitates that all the guns be unloaded, even if they're locked away. Uh, do you have like a is that something that you think there's any room for compromise on in the the, the um, research community compared to the gun owners gunning? Uh, sorry, gun owning community. I think if you're opposed to locking up the ammunition separately from the gun, at least lock the gun up. Mm. Uh, it's better than nothing. Yeah. I think obviously at least one gun. Solution. I think most people would want one gun that they can, you know, if you have multiple guns and you have children around, yes, absolutely lock up most of them separate from the ammunition, but most people are going to want to have a firearm uh, uh, available to them, not to their children, but to them for home defense in the case of that they need it, uh, which is where you get that sort of, uh, I'm, I'm like, I don't know if this is, I see this advice a lot is all I mean. And I don't know if um, 
how much the research community has grappled with this idea because it's a very poor idea for a lot of gun owners, right? Yeah, I think for me growing up in a country where this is not an issue at all, uh, where we definitely, if you have a gun, uh, it's against law to not have it separately from the ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think if you are in the situation where you need to have your gun next to your pillow in case someone should break into your house, then I don't think there would be that much of a difference if you were to reach under your bed and have to put on a fingerprint to get to that gun. Oh, yeah. Or if you had to reach under your pillow. And so I don't I think, think most there people are some steps that yeah, you can do. Yeah, certainly. I, I don't think most gunners would say they shouldn't have the gun locked away inside you know especially if you have children right if, if it's uh you know for me i'm i i have a gun here behind me on the wall obviously it's not i, I don't have children that ha that are coming into my apartment um and if i did i would lock the guns away but um but i think most people would agree that yes you can lock the gun up it, they just wouldn't want to have the gun unloaded because then you'd have to uh in a case of emergency you'd have to go and uh, slows down your response is the idea. Uh, and that's, I think what people, that, that's why I don't think there's a huge gap there between what a lot of gun research, gun violence researchers say, and what a, a lot of gun owners say on this particular point. Um, you know, it, it's just, we, most gun owners, I think would want the gun to be, uh, useful, right. If they needed it is, is I guess the, the main thing I'm getting across. I don't want to get us too sidetracked though on that. No, um, I think most researchers are giving you the recommendation of the ideal situation, uh, mm -hmm. saying that ideally you should have the ammunition locked up separately from the gun that is also locked up. Uh, we know that ideally uh, is the golden standard and that is what we're trying to push forward. Um, but we also, I know that many researchers that study gun violence would also like to see that there's no guns. And so uh, I think a compromise or a middle road would be to have it locked up at least, because we mm. still know that less than 50% of gun owners actually have them locked up. Mm. Right. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming on and, and, walking us through the study and how you performed it and what you found and some of the critiques that I had. I really appreciate you being willing to do that. So uh, hopefully we can have you on again in the future as well. If we talk more about this issue, I think it's a very important issue to find the best possible methods to preventing accidental shootings among children. It is, uh, while we've improved in this area as a country, it's still a significant problem and uh, something that we should all focus on trying to fix. Yeah, thank you for your interest in our research. Yeah, and so where can people find more of your writing if they're interested in, in doing that? Yeah, so we have actually published an article to OSU Press. There's also an article on the conversation, but the full paper is on JAMA Pediatrics. Okay, wonderful. The conversation, that was the publication of it earlier. I think I said the covenant or something. So <laughs> the conversation, that's where people should go and read uh, your write-up of it if they'd like to. But uh, And hey, uh, buy the paper too. I don't know how that works for academics, but I assume it's uh, helpful for you for people to subscribe to the uh, to the journal that your, your work is published in. So uh, yeah, consider doing that as well. But thank you so much for joining us. We're going to head on over to our news update now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly news update. I'm contributing writer Jake Fogelman, joined, of course, by Reload founder Stephen Gutowski. How are you doing this week, Steve? I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Jake? Doing pretty good. Can't complain. <laughs> nice. Uh, did you do anything fun over the, the last week here? You got any plans for the weekend? Uh, yeah, last weekend I, I was able to go to the range. I still haven't been able to shoot my new grand that I showed off a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I, I had to go to an indoor range because the weather was pretty bad last weekend. So they let you indoor, shoot the rifle. You can, the you range? can, but I always feel bad. at just you know blasting a thirty out six in an indoor bay next to some poor person <laughs> just trying to shoot their pistol. <laughs> I always fair. feel feel kind of guilty about that. So <laughs> so I just shot handguns, but I'm I'm still anxiously awaiting my opportunity to to go shoot that thing. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun. Um, maybe this weekend. Yeah. If the weather cooperates, we're looking, it's been just such a rainy year in Denver here. We've actually, I saw a headline we've been rainier than Seattle 
for like the first time mm -hmm. ever in Denver, Colorado, of all places. So it's just, it's just wow. been tough to get out there to the outdoor range like I like to. Yeah, it's been really smoky here all summer, thanks to yeah. Canada. Those dang but, Canadians. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, we should cut that place off and That's push right. it out into the, into the <laughs> Bugs uh, Bunny. <laughs> push it up into the Arctic. It's the, it's the Arctic up there, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Arctic. The Antarctic is the bottom. Anyway, <laughs> I had uh, my own adventures over the weekend. As I mentioned uh, on last week's show, I did my uh, my charity. I guess I should, we should mention this is we're filming on Thursday. So I know this, this comes out Sunday and then Monday. What I'm talking about, I guess, two weeks ago at this point, uh, by the time you guys are listening to this. But uh, yeah, I had my charity shoot for Homes for Our Troops, which you guys should look up and consider volunteering or donating to them. They, they build specialized homes for uh, wounded veterans. So, uh, make sure that you check them out by the way, but the, that's, uh, the winner Carter had, uh, uh you know, he, he paid a good amount of money to this charity, which is, uh, I always want to make people feel like they got their money's worth out of it. So we went up to the, the farm. We, we went to a friend's, uh, private range and they had a lot of great steel to shoot. They had a Texas star and a dueling tree and, and a bunch of stuff. And, Brought all, you know, every gun that that you could imagine for my collection. I brought my Sears Ghost gun, which is always a fun one. It's a semi-auto shotgun that Sears Roebuck made, the department store. And uh, it was before uh, 68, so there was no serial number on it because they weren't required back then. Not as long ago, you know, not that long ago, right? People don't realize this, but, um, you know, before the Gun Control Act, you you could uh, you could totally buy a gun with no serial number on it. There's no no issue like it is today, as um, I'm, well, I'm sure we'll mention here in a moment. But uh, anyway, you know, brought that, brought my um, 1911 that's Cerakoted to look like a P51 Mustang. Um, you know, all my other guns, my 320 X5 with the the Romeo dot and the um, X the 65 X Macro with the other Romeo dot. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, just all kinds of, of firearms. And we had a lot of fun shooting and, and uh, just hanging out for the day. It was hot and it rained a little bit, but didn't, didn't ruin the fun at all. Um, and then this week I have a, uh, you know, the Friday before this episode comes out, I've got uh, range day with the National Journalism Center. So um, we have a, an intern from there. Uh, who's done a lot of good work for us so far this summer, but uh, now I'm going out to the range in in Loudoun County. So the first my, my first time at this new range they've got out uh, west here in in northern Virginia. It's called Xcal. It's like a like a high end range with the, combined with like a CrossFit type of gym. I don't know. It seems interesting. Yeah, it seems like a nice facility. So it'll be my first time. It's like an hour away, unfortunately, <laughs> but so I have to get up early to do that. But that's actually why we're filming today. Normally we film these on, on Friday, but I'll be out there showing uh, these journalism interns, uh, some of the basics of firearms reporting, some of the significant issues that come up, trying to give them a, a, a base level knowledge on this stuff so they can be better reporters if they have to write about firearms in the future. And then they'll actually also, of course, experience shooting the guns, you know, sort of if you're going to report on basketball, you should probably shoot some hoops occasionally, right? Um, or at least once in your life. It's sort of idea, I think. Here, uh, you don't have to. I don't, I don't care what their political beliefs are on these things. I just want them to be informed and uh, educated and have some some foundation of knowledge before they go out in the world to report on this. Sure. Yeah. No. That that should be awesome. Then give give everyone a chance to, like you said, at least have some experience with firearms before they uh, go out there and. And write for a living, which is which is really important and sort of the driving one of the driving forces behind what we do as well. Try to give people information about a subject with, you know, from a position of expertise rather than speculation. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Yes. Informed and independent. That's the other part of we got the same. Uh, sorry, the sober, serious, sane, sane and sober. That's uh, active self-protection, which, by the way, if you haven't checked out their podcast, you totally should. I do the news, up, news update for them, but they have a new uh, person who's involved in an actual self-defense situ situation each week on to discuss what happened with them. Uh, if you've ever seen active self-protection videos on YouTube, it's kind of like taking one of their videos and 
talking to the person who was involved in it. That's really cool. But yes, sober, serious, but also informed and independent is the other half of our motto here. So um, that's what I'm trying to impart for these these up and coming reporters. And I think it's gone well the last couple of times we've done it. And I think it'll go well again this time. Yeah, that should be awesome. You'll have to give us an update next week on how it went. Um, but anyways, as we get to the news of the week, uh, we'll hit a few quick headlines from the newsletter. Um, one big thing that's happening right now is that apparently a group of Republican activists and some gun rights activists are launching a recall effort in the state of Michigan. Um, Michigan's been one of those states that has passed a few different gun control measures this year because it just switched to a trifecta Democrat state. And so it's interesting to see that you're starting to see some level of political backlash to that. I don't know how successful it's going to be. Um, but we'll have to keep an eye on that because that's, you know, an interesting reaction to uh, a state going all out on gun control. Yeah. Uh, you saw that in your home state a few years back. That's right. Colorado. Yeah, about a decade ago. Um, yeah, it was very successful in that, <clears throat> excuse me, in that moment, in that period, uh, but has not maintained the momentum since then, obviously. Right. Um, and this next one comes to us from The Trace. They had an interesting piece on the so-called enhanced background checks that were a part of that Bipartisan Safer Communities Act last summer, which was the first federal gun control bill uh, in decades to pass Congress and be signed by the president. Uh, and they're claiming that the FBI has informed them that around 253 people in the 18 to 20 year old age range were denied background checks that otherwise that they say at least otherwise wouldn't have been flagged by the system. And so they're painting that as right. evidence that this new system is is having some efficacy. Yeah, it's interesting that that was about point two percent of the background checks for that age group, according to the FBI. They, they ran like one hundred and sixteen thousand in this time period that they're uh, giving information to the trace about. Um, but I think it raises a lot more questions for me than it than it provides answers. Like what what exactly about the new system helped them to flag these people, right? These 250 or so people, you know, the claim is that the new system kept about 250 people from getting a gun who would have been prohibited from having it. Uh, and that the old system would not have, have done that, but, uh, and we'll have to follow up on this with the FBI and, and see what they say. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that they're going to have like a comprehensive report on this stuff and not just, occasionally leak out some numbers to the trace or any other publication um, so that we can, you know, the public can get a full understanding of what exactly is going on with the new system. Um, but, you know, to me, I wonder, you know, why, how, you know, what, what was it about this new process that, that found people who were prohibited from owning guns that the regular Nick system wouldn't have found them? Um, because I think there's a, there's a couple of, um, ways that you can interpret what they're saying, right? Uh, because they they don't give a lot of detail to the trace in this, um, at least not in this the piece that's written up right now. And so it could be a number of things, right? It could be that they're the new records that they're supposed to check, or the new sources that they're supposed to go to for as part of this background check are turning up records that um, that weren't included in NICS or wouldn't have been included in NICS. And it's a problem with compliance for NICS. That's been an ongoing issue for the background check system since it was created. There have been several bills to try and address that issue. Famously, uh, it was the problem that led to the Sutherland Springs shooting because that uh, perpetrator was prohibited from owning guns, but was able to buy them from a store anyway because he passed the background check because his records were not shared from the military to the FBI. And so um, is that what these 250 cases are? Were these records that should have been included but weren't? Were these records that wouldn't have ever been included but now are because of the new background check system for 18 to 20 year olds? Um, were these instances where the, the 18 to 20 year old was flagged, you know, they were delayed and under the uh, normal process, they would have been able to proceed with their purchase uh, after three days. Um, and they're implying that because there's effectively a 10 day window now for 18 to 20 year olds that, you know, maybe they caught them, they got the records on the seventh day. And so they were able to stop the sale from going through at all. Because that if that's what it is, it, I start to wonder if that's even 
a practical difference with the old system because uh, as much as talk as there's been, the old system after three days, they didn't just give up on f- trying to find you, right? Or trying to find your records. They would make a determination. They'd try to make a determination if they could. And if they found after the three day period that you were prohibited, they would send the F- ATF to go and get your gun from you. Like they didn't just throw their hands up and say, oh, well. So, uh, you know, the, the Charleston shooting, right? Which um, is the, the motivation for the name Charleston loophole, which talks about this three day delay proceed procedure. That was an, a situation where the FBI just screwed up. They just never found the disqualifying record. And um, it didn't have anything to do with, you know, it's not like the FBI would have given up. And so that, that's, there's a lot of questions here about what exactly is going on with these 250 cases. And so we'll, we'll have to look into it, obviously. Um, and so uh, you know, certainly we will. And hopefully the FBI will be forthcoming and give us more information. I'm, I'm hoping, though, that they'll put out like a public report that details all this stuff so we can uh, so everybody can look through it, of course, instead of, um, you know, just it was good reporting on the traces part to get this information. But, um, you know, I, I think we deserve a lot more. Right. And uh, also one other interesting bit, just before we move on to the next story with this, you'll notice in the trace piece at the end, they effectively say, right, that this is a de facto waiting period for these for this age group now, uh, which is something that we talked about when this was going through Congress, right, that that Cornyn, uh, the Republican senator from Texas who who backed this bill, claimed it wasn't a de facto waiting period, but here the trace uh, seems to agree with, with at least my interpretation of it, that this is effectively just a 10 day waiting period for these gun buyers. Um, and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of the background check system. The NICS is short for the national instant criminal background check system. Now there can be of course, delays that go on, um, if you're not instantly approved, but the idea was always meant to be that this was not going to be something that was a de facto waiting period. It's something that is, if you clear the background check, it should come through in minutes, not not days. And now this is a sort of fundamental switch in how the system works for 18 to 20 year olds, at least. And, um, you know, it seems like now it's, everyone is openly admitting this, that this is now clearly a waiting period for those gun buyers. Right. Yeah. Just a waiting period by other, by another name. Um, yeah. Like you said, we'll follow up. We'll definitely follow up on the story because there, as you said, that raises a number of questions that I think a lot of people will be interested in, in finding out the answers to. Um, a couple of other stories, ones that we wrote this week, we have two big ones out of Oregon. Uh, Oregon's been busy on the gun control front lately. I had one about their governor, Tina Kotek, just signed a bill to ban so-called ghost guns uh, in the state making them now the 13th state to do so. Um, it, basically, the bill mirrors essentially a lot of the other efforts that you've seen elsewhere, where it's just you can't manufacture, sell, or possess an unserialized firearm or a frame and receiver without a serial number. Um, it does give grace period until, I believe, August of next year, 2024, for folks to take those to an FFL and get them serialized. So if you already own one, um, that's, that's the way to, to get around it. And that's, that's when they say they're going to start enforcing it. They say they won't enforce it until then. Uh, but it's interesting yeah. that they've now become the next state to crack down on, on homemade firearms. Yeah. And you know, it's, uh, the other thing that's interesting about it too, is it seems to be based off of the federal rule that the ATF made, which has just been struck down as, um, yep. it's just been tossed right as, uh, violating the administrative procedure acts, basically that the ATF didn't have the power to do this. Um, because that whole idea of taking the gun to an FFL to have it serialized comes from the ATF's rule. Yep. And now the ATF's rule isn't um, going to be likely in effect. I, mean, I think there was a, there's an administrative stay placed on it for like five days to allow them to appeal that decision. But the, the longer stay was denied um, by the, the judge in that case. So depending on how the Fifth Circuit decides to handle it, that appeal, um, it's unlikely that 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 rule is going to remain in effect for much longer. And uh, so, you know, you're going to see this Oregon situation where they're trying to use a process from a, a federal rule that isn't 
going to exist any longer. Right. Um, and I don't know how that's going to work out exactly. And, and it, also, it interesting. Wonder, by the way, um, sorry, it was just real quick. Uh, do they, I don't know. Usually they'll have like a carve out, like the, the federal rule had a carve out for my Sears ghost gun, right? The pre 68 guns. Um, and I don't, I don't know if every state is actually doing that or what you're supposed to do with your older guns. Right. I believe Oregon's does have a carve out. Uh, okay. For, they classify, they do it uh, under an umbrella of like antique firearms, which usually refers right. to pre 1900. But I think in this case, it extends to 1968 as well, because as mm. you pointed out, they, they didn't require serial numbers back then. Uh, but just an interesting note about the federal rule about taking your, your so-called ghost gun to a FFL to get it um, serialized. On a practical note, because Colorado copied that same provision, Colorado was the, the other state that this year passed a ghost gun ban. And just uh, I, I know a reporter that's been asking FFLs around the state about you know how they're going to do this. And apparently most FFLs don't want any business, don't want any yeah. part of this. They think there's going to be liability involved. They don't want any yeah. part of helping serialize. These I don't know firearms. why a gun dealer would want to be involved in something like that. Anyway, right. you know, like they don't have to do that. They don't have to take those guns into their inventory. Right. Um, and they probably won't if you if they're required to go and uh, there was a whole like process that the ATF came up with for this where you had to like engrave it in a certain way and using certain techniques. And I don't know that you're going to find a lot of FFLs, especially smaller ones that are going to be willing right. to actually go through all that just to take an old yeah. gun or, or somebody's homemade gun into their inventory. Um, you, you know, uh, and yeah, when you ban possession. um Unless you get an FFL to serialize it, there's, I think in practice, that would make it very hard to actually get your gun serialized and actually keep yeah. your gun legally. But of course, the people who build homemade guns um, are also the kind of people who are unlikely to comply with something like this regardless. Right. right. That's the whole idea for a lot of these people uh, is that they don't want the government to know that they have this gun, um, whether they're. You know, that's like a strong motivating factor for most hobbyists who do this. Um, and then obviously for, for people who, who build their own guns for nefarious purposes, the, of course, they're not going to tell anyone, right. uh, any law enforcement. So uh, how much practical effect this has in real life, uh, you know, I'm pretty skeptical of. But well, it'll be interesting to see also how it plays out with the way that the federal rule is going down. So, Sure. We'll keep and the on. other big... The other big news out of Oregon, of course, is we had a federal judge just uh, rule to uphold the ballot initiated gun control uh, measure 114 from last year, uh, which was a permit to purchase requirement and a ban on magazines holding more than 10 rounds. And we have a federal judge who says that that comports with the nation's uh, history and tradition of firearms regulation and it will not be struck down. Yeah, I mean. I think that doesn't come as much a surprise because that same judge had already refused to issue a preliminary injunction along the same exact lines as which yeah, that's usually how these things go, right? If you get a preliminary injunction, it means that when the ruling comes down on the merits, you're going to win. And if you don't get the preliminary injunction, when the ruling comes down on the merits, you're going to lose. Like that's right. That's got to be like 90 percent, 99 percent of the time how those things go. Uh, same thing with uh, if you're anyone who wants to. Uh, sort of guess about what's going to happen in the pistol brace ban case in the Fifth Circuit. Well, the, uh, the plaintiffs are probably going to win that one because they got preliminary injunctions against the rule, which only happens if there's a, a strong likelihood that they're going to win on the merits. That's how preliminary injunctions work, right? Um, they're, uh, even though they you know, go through the whole trial period, you're still unlikely to have a different outcome from what happened during the preliminary injunction phase of the court case. So anyway, you know, we'll see if that, how long that stands. That's, that's sort of that, that, uh, she was pretty pioneering, I would say in terms of how, um, judges have worked to uphold some of these hardware bans. You saw the same basic reasoning used in this case, uh, as the Delaware, uh, judge used to uphold their assault weapons ban, uh, a while back. So, um, It'll be what will be really interesting is once these make it to the appellate court level, whether, you know, the Ninth Circuit or the Fourth Circuit is going to uh, is going to go that same path if they think it's a strong enough argument to actually uh, withstand Supreme Court scrutiny. And, and ultimately, I think you'll have to see if the Supreme Court itself is going to take one of those cases. 
um, that's probably what it's going to come down to, I would think, in the end. I think that's right. Yeah. And, and as you pointed out, she was one of the first after Bruin to come up with this sort of hardware ban argument. Um, yep. And another interesting note, she's actually a Trump appointed judge. So just more yeah. evidence that the president that appoints a judge is not necessarily indicative of how they're going to rule in every case. Uh, so it's just not a, always. I think it's an interesting, interesting note there. Mm -hmm. um, and then speaking of judges brings us to our last story. Uh, you had a piece about a federal judge out of San Jose that just uh, ruled to dismiss the Second Amendment claims of some gun rights plaintiffs challenging their mandatory gun owner insurance and fee law that they passed. Um, so that's a little bit interesting, too. And this and you pointed out in your piece that this uh, ruling kind of hinged on some interesting history that we've kind of seen before. But it, it, I think there's something to it on in this case, if you want to talk about how they they came to that decision. Yeah, this is another one like the Oregon case where the judge and judge here denied a preliminary injunction. And now when he gets to the merits, he's upholding the law. Um, but I think unlike the Oregon case, these hardware ban cases and the, the reasoning they've used to try and uphold these modern bans under Bruin, um, you know, has been fairly, I think it's fairly shaky, uh, personally. I mean, we'll see how the courts, how the Supreme Court chooses to handle this. I don't think that they do a particularly good job of, of coming to the conclusion that the, that like assault weapons bans are constitutional under Bruin. Um, you know, it's a, there's a lot of roundabout lo logic that goes into it. And there aren't really sh any historical analogs that they cite that are actual hardware bans, right? Um, whereas, you know, the San Jose case also seems like it would be fairly straightforward on first glance because this is a first of its kind uh, restriction, right? You can't own a gun. Or, uh, I mean, now it's a. This is the other thing, too, is that San Jose has kind of walked back a lot of this ordinance and 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 said that it's not what it was when they were passing it. Right? The, the idea of this was like, basically, you couldn't own guns unless you buy this insurance or you couldn't own guns unless you pay this fee to this nonprofit there to fight gun violence um, or deal with the effects of gun violence uh, to try and make the whole idea was like, oh, make gun owners pay for the effects of gun violence. Um, because every gun owner is responsible for criminal uh, behavior, apparently, uh, is the is the thought here. Uh, but regardless, they've really walked that back a lot. You know, now now they're saying, you know, you need, you don't need insurance to cover potential criminal acts that you might commit because well, you can't legally buy insurance like that. Uh, instead, you just need accidental uh, shooting coverage. And they're arguing now that like homeowners insurance would cover this, uh, renters insurance would cover this. And so th they've really, they've really drawn back exactly what this does. But either way, the judge in this case, I think makes an argument that is uh, closer to what might be acceptable to the Supreme Court than these Oregon cases, at least in my view of it and I'll have an analysis piece on this as well that that'll be available for, for I think it should be available now for people to read by the time this comes out but um you know the the, the they use the surety laws now I don't think these are exact matches but the the thing is that Bruin says um you don't need an exact match it doesn't need to be a, a twin um and, and so like it, it, at least they're in the same realm of insurance like products because that's you know a surety is kind of a type of insurance. Now it was it was meant to be specific to somebody who was accused of being a danger for a specific reason, not just general uh, gun ownership. Or and and it was also related to gun carry, not having guns in the home. So there, I don't know that it works completely, but it is closer, I think, in a lot of ways to uh, what uh, what what the court is actually looking for in terms of Bruin. Uh, and, and historical analogies. So I, I think this at first glance seems obviously like it wouldn't withstand Bruin scrutiny because this is a brand new concept that hasn't existed before. No one's ever tried to force people to buy insurance to own firearms um, just to have them in your house, but uh, or pay a fee to a, a, a nonprofit just to own a firearm. Um, 
But at the same time, you also did see uh, not the majority, but Roberts and Kavanaugh in the concurrence noted that for gun carry, you can require a permitting uh, regime as long as it's shall issue and the fees aren't exorbitant. And so this fee is going to be like 25 bucks, I think. And they, the court effectively put gun carry on the same level as gun ownership. So if you, things you can require for gun carry, you may be able to require for gun ownership as well. Um, so that's where, you know, depending on the way this is implemented and the way the, the amount of money involved, they may, you know, you may see this as something that gets further um, or is at least a better argument than what some of these other uh, judges have used to uphold things like hardware bans, if that makes sense. Right. And I, you know, and I think it's interesting, like you said, we'll have to see once this ordinance finally flushes out, you know, whatever, 18 months since it's been, since it was passed, but because now other states yeah. and other jurisdictions have kind of copied San Jose, they were the mm -hmm. first, but now New the state of New Jersey, for example, in their big Bruin response bill added an insurance requirement that also includes carry insurance, not just home ownership insurance. So it's just interesting to see, you know, I, I'm sure that will be challenged once that actually takes effect. Um, and it will be interesting to see if the legal logic holds from this, that sureties become the yeah. analog that gets used. I don't know. Like, like I said, I don't, I don't know that this all really follows um, right. or that it's a, is really a perfect match. Also, I, you'd have to show that the, the other issue that I think this argument runs into is that, um, you know, at least with the hardware bands, they have tried to make an argument about how there's a modern problem caused by, you know, technological development. So mass shootings, whether this argument works or not, They've tried to make they, they've actually articulated an argument here because Bruin uh, basically Bruin says if it's if it's a condition that existed at the founding, then, you know, in order for the modern restriction, modern law, if they're trying to uh, address a, a condition that existed during the founding era with a modern law, then that modern law has to be uh, analogous to founding era gun regulations. Uh, now, if you're addressing a modern problem that's arisen from technological advancement or what have you, something that the founders didn't have to deal with at the founding, then you can be a little more, uh, you can be a little looser with what counts as a, as an analogy. You just need to find a how and why have to sort of match in, in, uh, in general terms. Now, what level of generality is a huge ongoing debate, uh, right? That we're probably going to see some answer for in this new Supreme court case, but, uh, th that's probably the weakest part of this San Jose ruling is that, you know, is gun violence generally, which is what they're trying to, or accidental shootings. That's supposedly what they're trying to address with, um, with the insurance mandate. And then, uh, gun violence generally is what the fee is trying to address were those things are those things modern creations like the the founders founders not have to deal with either of those i think that's going to be harder to um harder to a harder hurdle to to cross for this sort of uh reasoning the judge uses because there certainly weren't any actual like insurance requirements for owning a gun or fee payments to a nonprofit to deal with gun violence during the founding era. Uh, and of course this judge, I will note too, that there are also first amendment claims for the, the fee thing. Cause the, the government's forcing you to pay a nonprofit uh, that you may not agree with the message of and the sort of uh, compelled speech argument there. And the judge didn't dismiss that claim. Um, he said, basically can't, can't determine it because they haven't actually set up this whole system, this fee system, because there's no nonprofit that wants to do this yet. So um, those claims might still also be successful down the line, even under this particular judge. But and either way, I think it's it's something that on the surface would seem pretty straightforward. Uh, this law is not going to work under Bruin. But when you dig down into the legal reasoning, it's not as 
um, it, it's something that I think could get more traction than people might expect. Yeah, I think that's right. But we'll have to we'll follow it for sure. Yep, but that's all we got for this week. Um, so make sure you like and share and comment and review and do all the things that, that you can to help us grow the podcast. Uh, we're in the sort of uh, the dull days of the dog days of summer here in a non-election year. So, um, you know, it's it's there's less attention than normal. So anything you guys can do to help grow the show is going to help us uh, as reporters here at the reload. And then, of course, um, you can help us directly by <clears throat> joining the reload, buying membership. That's how we fund our reporting. We are completely independent, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we don't have any corporate backers or billionaires bankrolling us. So it's our members who keep the place going. Um, and so if you want to help do that, you can check out our membership options over at the reload today, but that's all we've got for you. We will be back again real soon.